friends, we are going to talk about variations. Now, either in plants or in animals, we have two types of reproduction. One, sexual reproduction. Another one, asexual reproduction. So, sexual reproduction is mainly responsible for causing variations. How? So, during sexual reproduction, which involves meiosis during the formation of gametes, as a result of gametic union, we have recombination of genes occur. Recombination of genes occur. Recombination of genes. Recombination of genes occur. As a result, we have changes in the phenotypic characters of the offspring from the parents. This is called variation. So, sexual reproduction, meiosis, recombination of genes, change in phenotypic character of the offspring from the parents. This is called variation. So, how are normally the variations come? What is a variation? So, variation is nothing but a change or a difference that exists among the individuals of the same species or of the offspring of the same pair. So, variation that exists among the individuals of the same species. For example, between the two lions, between the two tigers. We are not comparing a tiger and lion for finding out the differences. Only the differences between the individuals of the same species or of the offspring from the same pair. We are comparing one pair with his offspring. This is called variation. Now the variations normally play a major role because they act as raw material and that play a major role in evolution. So evolution is taking place only in the presence of variations because variations are the raw materials for evolution. So without variations, evolution is not possible. That's about what is variation, a difference that exists among the individuals of the same species and of the offspring from the same parent. So offspring and the parents of the same family. Now, what are the types of variations? We have two types of variations. One, somatic variations, and the one, general variations. What are the properties? What are the characteristics of somatic variations? Normally, the somatic variations occur in that is somatic cells. Somatic cells. And number two, they are not inheritable. They are not inheritable. They are not inheritable. That means if there is any change in the body cells, that is not being inherited. For example, we are meeting an accident, then after recovery, you have the scar. While you are getting married, that scar will not be transmitted to your children. And that is the meaning for that one. Any change in the somatic cells will not be inherited. Now, such somatic variations are mainly caused because of the environmental factors. Environmental factors are responsible for the formation of a formation of somatic variations. I mentioned already the environmental factors, for example, it may be an accident or any flood or any other calamities that cause change in the organism's body, which will not be transmitted. So these are the three important properties of somatic variations. Somatic cells, it occurs and then not heritable, not being transmitted to the next generation and also it is caused by environmental factors. Now about the germinal variations. What are germinal variations? These variations occur in the germinal cells. Germinal cells. What are germinal cells? The sperms and eggs. Sperms and eggs. These are all called germinal cells. Sperm and the egg. And when there is a change in these cells, they are being inherited. So such variations are heritable. Such variations are heritable. And these variations occur either in ancestors, occur in ancestors. 
already there in ancestors or occurs suddenly occurs suddenly in an individual that's about the germinal variations so it occurs in the germinal cells any change is being heritable it occurs in ancestors or in individuals it occurs suddenly now what are the types of germinal variations we have two different types of germinal variations one continuous variations another one discontinuous variations what are continuous variations now these variations are small variations that occurs in organisms number two they are also called as fluctuating variations fluctuating fluctuating variations now they occur normally in individuals by the accumulation of such variations accumulation of such variations occur in individual due to the accumulation of variations now between the two characters or two extremities there are some what are called intermediate stages some intermediate stages so these variations are small they are also called as fluctuating variations they occur with the accumulation of variations in an individual and between the two extremities for example if we are taking the human skin color human skin color we have five different shades of skin color generally generally we can see five different types of skin color for example negro then we have black then we have black too then we have what is called the light and finally white white so we have five shades of skin color negro black mulatto then light and then white mulatto means intermediate skin color the asians have intermediate skin color now the negro one extreme white another extreme so between these two extremities we have intermediate forms so in continuous variations we can have intermediate forms when we two extremities some intermediate forms are present the examples for continuous variations number one human skin color number two that is height number three body weight and also eye color of an individual so these are all examples for continuous variations so continuous variations are small variations they are also called fluctuating variations they occur in individuals by the accumulation of such variations the examples are height body weight eye color and human skin color and between the two extremities we have intermediate forms so what do you mean by discontinuous variations now the discontinuous variations occur by sudden change sudden change they occur by sudden change by mutation by mutation there are no intermediate forms no intermediate forms no intermediate forms for example we have studied garden pea plant if we are taking the height of the plant we have one variety tall another variety dwarf so this is one extreme there is another extreme but in these two varieties there are no intermediate forms that what i mentioned is continuous now actually these are all formed because of mutation a sudden change that occurred in the genetic material and such large mutations are also called macrogenesis sudden jump such mutations are called sudden jump macrogenesis all of a sudden because of mutation one form gets converted into another such a large mutations which are called macrogenesis 
are not useful to the organism. Now the best example, the first mutation was observed. The first mutation was observed by Seathright. By Seathright. The example for discontinuous variation is short legged and concrete of sheep. Short legged and concrete of sheep. It was observed by a scientist Seathright. Now it, it is an example for discontinuous variation. Now all of a sudden in one generation this breed produce short legged lambs. So this is an example for mutation and also discontinuous variation. The another example is polydactyl in humans. In some humans you might have observed the presence of extra digit, the sixth digit. That condition is called polydactyl. It also occurred all of a sudden due to mutation and that occurs in the case of individuals controlled by a dominant character or controlled by a dominant gene. Hi students, let us pass on to the next part of the lesson, Paleobacter. In brief, Paleo means old. The study of old plants or the ancestor plants, the extinct plants, the fossil plants. That is called Paleobacter. Now it is a branch of paleontology deals with recovery and identification of plant remains, the past lived organisms which are left extinct forms of the geological past. So that is called paleobotany. You know paleontology the study of fossils. Here we are talking about the fossils only related to botany, the fossils, plant fossils. Now a plant fossil is nothing but a preserved plant part, any preserved plant part that has been actually died for long back. A plant fossil is a prehistoric preservation. Prehistoric preservation that may be hundred to million years. Now, in the case of plant fossils, the plant fossils are only what we have that is disarticulated plant parts only. It is rare to be formed as the whole plant as a fossil. So we can get only the fragments, the disarticulated plant parts only as fossils, not as a whole plant. Now what is the importance of this paleopanthology? Paleopanthology. So number one, it throws light on phylogeny light on phylogeny light on phylogeny just actually on evolution light on phylogeny that is sorry light on phylogeny of evolution light on phylogeny of evolution and also it normally helps to historical approach of the plant kingdom, historical approach of the plant kingdom, helps in historical approach of plant kingdom. It is also used in the classification of plants, classification of plants. This is another one. The last one, it can be used in what is called descriptive morphology and anatomy of plants. Descriptive morphology and anatomy of plants. Descriptive anatomy and morphology. So this is all what we have the significance of plant fossils, light on phylogeny of animals, sorry the plants, light on phylogeny of evolution. I mentioned already phylogeny, the study of ancestors, the developmental stages that occur in the ancestral forms, that is called phylogeny. 
it also helps to what we have the historical approach of plant kingdom that is about the historical aspect what we have the different types of plants since from the past used to classify the plants based on evolution that is phylogeny and also it is used or it can be used to use for descriptive anatomy and morphology of plants these are some of the actually the benefits or the significance of plant fossils let us talk about some people related to biobotany one person caspar maria von stenberg he was born in europe he is called father of paleobotany and he established one museum in that is what is called pray the place one museum what is called bohemian national museum bohemian national museum in prague that is a museum established by him also he deemed to be considered as the founder of modern paleontology modern paleontology or we can say modern paleobotany if we take strictly paleobotany founder of modern paleobotany so this is one person another person in india birbal sahani he is called father of indian paleontology he made research work on two areas of paleobotany what are the areas one that is anatomy and morphology anatomy and morphology morphology of paleozoic forms paleozoic forms this is number one another just actually research work anatomy morphology of paleozoic forms so the forms that lived during the paleozoic era which is called actually the cradle for ancient life another one that is uh, fossils actually plant fossils plant fossils of indian gondwana indian gondwana formation indian gondwana formation so in that area he studied the research work about the fossils formation so these were the contributions by birbal sahani he aptly called father of indian paleobotany hi students we have to go for another aspects of evolution what is called fossilization what is fossilization the process of formation of fossils the process of formation of fossils is called fossilization we have different methods that are adapted for fossilization what are the types of fossilization on the methods one petrification what is petrification when an animal or a plant dies its original soft tissues or the hard parts are replaced by minerals molecule per molecule normal actually the element used is silica and the animal dies its original body part the organic tissues are replaced molecule per molecule that is by different elements the most common element is is called silica so by this method we have received petrified fossils containing the hard and soft parts now mold and cast now what is mold so normally it is a replica of the dead animal or plant replica the exact count replica of the exact animal part or the plant part what is a mold when the animal dies or when the animal buried deep at the bottom the original body parts are dissolved in water and the formation of hollow depression occurred hollow depression for example let's assume 
An elephant which lived ten million years ago walked on a sand. It left imprints, and that hollow depressions, the footprint is called as a mole. Now, when the mole, normally the mole gives actually the real shape of the animal part or the plant part, but it does not reveal or shows the internal structure. It gives only the shape of the part, the imprint does not give the internal organization, does not reveal. So the hollow depression is called mold. For example, for making a brick, we have a frame. This is the frame, brick. Or making what we have in a statue, we have a mold. And now when the depression or the mold is filled with the sediment or minerals, we are getting what is called the cast. So cast is nothing but actually the filled minerals or sediments of the mold. See, in the case of uh, an elephant which walked on a land of muddy sand, we have received hollow depression. When the hollow depression is filled with sediment or minerals, we are getting a shape of what is called the foot of an elephant. That is called a cast. So mold is a hollow depression and cast is a sediment or mineral that fill the hollow depression. Now the next one is preservation. In preservation, the actual remains, the entire organism, the entire plant or animal is preserved. So we have different mechanisms for preservation. The entire animal or plant is preserved as such without any decay by some materials released by plant body. This is called amba. So it is a resin-like substance. A resin like substance released by the plant body. When the insect stuck to this amber, the amber is acting as a preservative and preserving the entire insect acid for millions of years. That is, it is acting as a preservative. Another one, ice. So, one example a woolly mammoth in Siberia. You know the place of Siberia covered with snow always. An elephant which lived daily more than 20,000 years back was recovered as such without any decay or damage from Siberia. It is also an example for preservation of actual remains. So, in preservation, the original body of an organism is present. Now, the next one comes. When an animal or a plant just settle at the bottom of the sea, because of the death. What is happening? The dead body is surrounded by sediments. When the sedimentation is going on continuously, a fossil is formed. We have a compressed rocks closing what is called the entire animal and that is called compression. The next one, infiltration or replacement. So in the case of actually infiltration or replacement, the entire organism or the original body part is normally infiltrated into the cell wall. From where it is being normally carried into the body, pass, so that what is happening, the original body parts are replaced by some mineral elements. The common elements which are infiltrated are used for replacement of the organic tissues, either carbon, or calcium carbonate, magnesium carbonate, magnesium carbonate, or silica, double carbonates of calcium and magnesium, etc. So these are the elements which are used for replacing the original body parts, the organic molecular tissues, and so that we are getting what is called hard, that is fossil structure. Now in this method, hard parts of the animal body or the plant body are preserved. And this is all the different methods. Carbonization is nothing but the replacement of the original body parts by calcium carbonate or magnesium carbonate. That is called carbonization. So this is nothing but a kind of what is called infiltration or a kind of petrification. Either in petrification or in infiltration, the molecular tissues what because the organic molecules of the tissues are replaced molecule per molecule by the minerals. That's why it's called sedimentation or mineralization by sedimentation. 
The petrification or infiltration or replacement is otherwise called mineralization by sedimentation or we can say sedimentation process by mineralization. The next part dating of fossils or determination of age of fossils that is when it occurred the formation of fossils. So the age of the fossils can be determined by the presence of radioactive element present in it by the presence of radioactive element present in it the radioactive element present in the fossil may be a carbon or we have uranium or lead or potassium these are all the radioactive elements present in the fossils. By calculating the half-life period of the fossils radioactive element, one can calculate the age of the fossils. So, what is happening? Now, what is the use of dating of fossils? It is used by the paleontologists and anthropologists. Anthropology, study of humans. Anthropologists those who study human, that is uh, actually evolution and other things. So it is used in paleontology and paleontologists and also anthropologists to determine the age of humans and their manuscripts. So the anthropologists use what we call the radioactive method to calculate the age of humans and their manuscripts. Now, we have different methods that are adapted for calculating the age of the fossil. So, what are the methods we have? Carbon-14 method. The best method adapted for calculating the age of the fossils is carbon-14 method. Carbon-14 method. Also, we have uranium lead method. This is another one. Lead method. The third one, potassium and organ method potassium and argon method. So these are all the different methods adapted to calculate the age of the fossils. Now carbon-14 radioactive method. Now normally this carbon-14 radioactive method is the best method for dating the fossils or calculating the age of the fossils. Normally either the plants or animals stop their consumption of carbon after death. After that, there is no consumption of carbon either by the plant or by the animals. Since then, only the decay of carbon-14 present in the dead body or the fossil occurs. So, when the time passed, since from the death, the age of the fossil can be calculated by measuring the amount of carbon-14 present in that is the fossil because the isotopes have the ability of undergoing decay the period of decay can be calculated by mix of half-life period one measurement I don't to touch that one anyway carbon-14 is present in the dead body of plants and animals after that body they undergo decay the time passes from the death we can calculate that is the age of the fossils by measuring the amount of carbon-14 present in it. This is what is called carbon-14 method, the best method adapt. Now, what is the living force? This is the dating of fossils. What is the living force? So, it is a living organism that is similar in appearance to their distant ancestral forms. So, an organism similar in appearance to the distant ancestral forms. But it has no close actually future to the extinct organisms. Or we can say the organism which remain unchanged over millions of years. We have in the book given one plant, what is called Jingo by Lopa. So this is what is called maiden hair, commonly called as maiden hair. 
the place of origin China. So the plant appeared that is thousands of years back. Till today having the same structure without any modification. So evolution makes change. But in the case of this plant, since from its appearance, there is no change. It remains as such where it formed. So the organism which remains unchanged over millions of years is called living fossil. So these organisms refuse evolution, not responding to evolution. If it is responding to evolution, there is a change, but there is no change. We have a number of animals. For example, limbless an animal, it's not even in the book, commonly called as a king crab. It's not related to the crab, a different animal. It's having the characteristics, the same characters, when it originated in the world. Such animals are called living fossils, remain unchanged over millions of years. Now, we have fossils obtained from one area in Villapuram districts, what is called Thirivikarai. Thirivikarai, a place in Villapuram district. It's also called as a wood park. Wood park. Where just a fossil plants were obtained which lived millions of years ago. Till today, they are maintaining the color, the shape, the annual rings, the texture as the original plants had. So this is an example for a place in Tamil Nadu, Milipuram district, Trivikari, which otherwise called as uh, normally wood park, where you have fossil plants having color, shape, annual rings, the texture that resembled the original plant that lived millions of years ago. So there is a conclusion for fossilization. Thank you.